please welcome to the show Consortium News Live producer, Dame Kathy Bogan. Before we get into the questions, I do just want to give a big plug to Consortium News Live. It is a tremendous program. I want to thank you guys for putting out that series because you have had uh, some of the most incredible people on that program and you cover basically everything. We have particularly covered the Assange story. In one of our little fundraising things, Joe wrote that we're the best. We're the best for that. I guess that was a claim we could make when after we'd been to London and we were doing up to four events a day. People who traveled from all over the world. This was in the week leading up to Julian Assange's first week of hearings. Incidentally, thank you so much for saying it. it's a good show. Um, you know, it goes together very quickly and, you know, you, you have to follow the news cycle. Yeah, before I forget, I'd just like to do a plug for what's on tonight. And uh, so we are doing a two hour live show tonight. We go live for the launch of Andrew Fowler's updated edition of The Most Dangerous Man in the World. It just became available online on the 2nd of July, so you can now buy it. Andrew very kindly sent us a copy of the book. So The Most Dangerous Man in the World has been built by a lot of people who have followed the WikiLeaks story for you know, Julian story for 10 years or more like myself and this is the best book ever written and now andrew has added three new chapters three and in particular he goes deeply into the uc global story and what he specifically does is he tracks the digital footprint of the uc global data uc global was a security company that was employed by the Ecuadorian government to guard the embassy. They never had guards before that. If you listen to Fidel Naves, who was the chief of service at the Ecuadorian embassy for six to seven years, he says that when Julian got there, a need was recognized to protect him because, you know, we've even heard since that there were plots to poison him and break in and he was awakened at two o'clock in the morning. This was announced in court that, that somebody was throwing things or trying to get in through the window. And he was woken up by, I think, a fire extinguisher falling over. But anyway, um, so Andrew has written about that. And one thing I can tell you is that he said that he couldn't track it the whole way to the CIA, but he could track it without a problem and that's documented in, in this new edition to the Department of State, the United States Department of State. Now I should just tell you that the, the security company were apparently okay for a while. Julian himself and many of us never trusted that company from day one. However, David Morales, who was the head of the company, went to a Las Vegas conference and met somebody there who persuaded him to uh, work for a second client. Um, and that was the people on the other side who wanted to know everything that Assange was doing 24 hours a day, spied on his lawyer's uh, privileged meetings between lawyer client. That's sacrosanct in law mm -hmm. that you cannot spy the prosecution cannot spy on the defense and find out what their strategy is so this is you know all of these violations you would think any one of them would end the whole thing but in a sound case it doesn't so also on doctors uh, people examining julian um every single guest his family they were even um apparently interested in baby Gabriel's uh, nappies to do a, a DNA test. And it just went so far it, that it was one of their local guys approached Stella, Stella Morris, the mother of Julian's children, and said, don't bring the baby back here anymore because uh, they're after the baby's uh, DNA. They suspected that Gabriel was Julian's son. I mean, to look at him, you couldn't deny him. So I, I could understand them thinking that this might be Julian's son, but uh, 
you know, they wanted to confirm it, which is just crazy, crazy stuff. That so anyway, is uh, just real quick, that is one of the most just all around disgusting aspects about all of this. The UC Global, under orders from either the State Department or the CIA or both, yeah. was willing to root around in a trash bin yeah. to extract a diaper so that they could test the feces just to have something to hold over Ju something else to hold over julian's head there's no well, other well, explanation for why they would want that well it's not it's not even the people on the ground like those people that are mercenaries those like former soldiers that did special forces that joined to do whatever is like thrill seeking to them i assume they don't want to get fucking diapers out of trash cans <laughs> like that's that's why they told them Sheldon Adelson, um, what Rick Grinnell, all those like sleazy, slimy, dirty behind the scenes bastards. Those are the kind of people that want to get the diaper out of the trash can because they're the ones that want to have something to hold up. So when that big tough war veteran guy gets told, "Hey, go grab that poopy diaper," he's like, what the "Fuck's going on? Like this is crazy." <laughs> At least that's kind of how I see it. Well, I think uh, you know from what Stella says. Um... The guard uh, just felt very bad about it, about the intentions, what the purpose was. They knew what the purpose was, and they just thought that that was way below the bottom line. So Andrew was able to trace the UC Global data that they had. They had uh, put in a lot of extra surveillance cameras and microphones, even in the fire extinguisher, even in the toilet, and that was being streamed to the United States. So Andrew Fowler was able to trace it to Department of State and, and to members of the Trump family and close associates. So that's very interesting. Just one last thing I wanted to show you, and this is, this is one of mine, it's a, <laughs> I'm showing you my artwork. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, of course, it's Monopoly, <laughs> but it is um, the WikiLeaks version of Monopoly. And every one of those, are, these four are the, are the countries, uh, UK, Sweden, Ecuador, and the United States that have been torturing him. Um, and every one of these is a um, an addition, a WikiLeaks addition, you go around. Oh, wow. Can we try to find a way to get that into a shop somewhere? <laughs> well, That's amazing. That's so amazing. <laughs> and this is, uh, what does it say? Um, collect another award. As you, when you <laughs> land here, you collect another award. And here, like, you know, goes straight to Belmarsh, etc. So I've had this sitting around for a while. And I, I put up the file on Twitter so that people could just download it and do it themselves. But um, it cost me about 50 bucks to um, put it on canvas and now it's playable. However, um, I've got the cards, I've got the cards and of course you can't play Monopoly without your chance. And of course, you know, there's been a lot of bad luck, uh, but also good luck um, for, for Julian. So I'm looking forward to doing the chance cards. Um, yeah, it could be, um, I made a mask for Julian, um, not for him. Well, it'd be good if he could wear it, but uh, for supporters of Julian, Christine, his mother, thought was quite a good idea. So um, that's in the WikiLeaks shop now, and that's uh, Save Julian from COVID-19. I spoke to Bean about it, and Bean has done a few designs as well for people who didn't want COVID-19 written on their face. I understand. But in fact, that is that that is the crucial factor that that could take him out uh, at any moment. That is the immediate threat, and that's the message we need to get home. That you know, prisons being petri dishes. I think that there was um, there's a prison in the United States where I actually looked about uh, three weeks ago. Seventy five percent of the prisoners have coronavirus. And poor Julian has a chronic lung condition. I remember his dreadful cough 
which became apparent um, about 2013. It might have been around uh, before then, but he has a rasping cough. If you look at cypherpunks, um, I don't know if you know that what that is. That's one of two oh, yeah. of the episodes of The World Tomorrow. You can hear him coughing occasionally there, but he has, uh, you know, in every in every speech that he gave, you could hear him constantly trying to clear his throat. So he's got this chronic condition. In 2018, John Pilcher spoke in Sydney, did a, a terrific speech. Uh, we've got it on Consortium News now because I filmed it. He talks about Julian's father's letter to Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister. And uh, in that, he says that Julian has needed an X-ray for years to determine what this lung condition is. He has a relentless cough, but is denied safe passage to and from a hospital for even an X-ray. The British wouldn't let him go to the hospital. Obviously, the X-ray unit couldn't be brought to him. Um, he has other he has other serious conditions. He needed root canal therapy. He's had two years of toothache. Um, the last time I spoke to Christine in an interview, so that that would be four years now. Um, but you know, it's something to be aware of that we have to keep fighting. And doctors for Assange have been really excellent. They they've written another brief but superb letter. Uh, chastising those who can pull the strings to just get him bail and an anklet, you know, and, and back to his family into a, a bit more safety. But they haven't, and, and doctors for Assange have warned them that they can be held uh, culpable, responsible for that, um, because it's just uh, in the law, it's a bit like the, um, I, I suppose you've all heard of the Eichmann excuse. Uh, Eichmann, yeah, yeah and in, from Nuremberg. Uh, so neither I was just following orders, nor I sat passively by and let it happen is any good. And that's what we were all saying about, you know, in defense of uh, Chelsea Manning. When you see a war crime, you have a duty to report it, but also to not let it happen uh, to the best of your ability, which is, uh, you know, what she tried to do and uh, and one of those leaks was really really important because that that one from 2006 with the slaughter of uh, um, 10 civilians Iraqi civilians that was what uh, including five children um you know just execution basically and that they're, that, that they're ended not, the war sort of what is it what does it say to you that the U.S. isn't including the collateral murder video in their charges against Julian Assange. Well, in fact, uh, it's not. It's it's very cute of them the way they've done it. They don't specifically mention it, but what they do have in the indictment relates to the rules of engagement. And Manning released uh, the released. I mean, late uh, the rules of engagement. So these are rules whereby US soldiers can uh, launch an attack, engage, as they called it euphemistically, with the enemy. It's funny because engagement usually is a nice thing where you are going to get married one day and um, they, it's, uh, you know, a dysphemism, uh, as they call it. It's engage has totally changed its meaning uh, for most of us because now we think of it as killing people. But um, Manning released the rules of engagement from their archives to prove to prove that they had not been respected. Now, with the with the people uh, who were in the street, including the two Reuters journalists, I mean, it was easy to explain that uh, maybe they thought that the camera was a was a weapon, but certainly the second part where where they open fire on the van, the good Good Samaritans van that stops to to rescue one of the Reuters journalists who has not yet died. And that's a very touching story that Dean Yates from, you know, who was the bureau chief of Reuters brought forward. The generals came, I think three generals, he said, came to show him because Reuters had been trying to find out what had happened to their journalists, you know, and they came and showed 
Dean Yates and made him sign a non-disclosure. A little bit of it, a little bit of it, um, and I think right up to where the people in the street are fired upon, um, that's where it stops, so as not to upset him, but they didn't show him the second part, which is clearly a war crime. That's what violates the rules of engagement, to open fire on a wounded person that people are trying to rescue. This is obscene. As Manning said at the time, it was like somebody was holding a magnifying glass on ants. And, you know, that, that level of cruelty, uh, you know, and also the sound from the, what he didn't hear was the audio either, which was oh. the point of, right? <laughs> which was what those, those dudes, a crazy horse ate, was actually saying. You know? Look at those dead bastards. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, and even, so after that, there's another war crime that happens that can be pointed out really obviously, and that's the running over of the bodies. Of course. When the, when the, the, the vehicle pulls up, the U.S. troops pull up to secure the scene, they're literally just running bodies over and joking about it. And that's a part that's not really, that's the one of the most uncomfortable things in there is the fact that like they just slaughtered these people and then have the goal to laugh as they get run over. Well, folks, you'll see in the indictment um, mentioned um, a few times, Executive Order 13526, which is, you know, the classification system basically information is classified as um, confidential, secret, top secret, and there are various subdivisions within that. And so all of this, the definition of what level, you know, that like could cause uh, harm, uh, will definitely cause harm to uh, United States uh, national interests, etc., national security. But what they don't talk about is section 1.7. Right. Section 1.7 of Executive Order 13526 makes it illegal to classify evidence of a crime or anything that causes embarrassment to a government. So look out for Section 1.7 because what that tells us is things like collateral murder and a lot of other atrocities should never have been classified in the first place. And in fact, collateral murder wasn't. It was never classified. It was, according to Manning, if you, I was going back a long way, but I remember Manning saying that this video had been sitting on the shelf for a couple of years and he didn't know. And after he looked at it, oh, she looked at it, I should say she now, um, she said, Ah, so that's what that is, and and it was the the footage uh, from the Baghdad airstrike in two thousand and seven, which was reported quite differently. The Reuters were told that their journalists were killed in a confrontation, right, with, with insurgents, and that wasn't the case at all. When Dean Yates came out, he said that the other Reuters journalists who were on the ground, and they didn't see any skirmish. Uh, and they also got um, one of the Reuters journalists who were killed, they recuperated his camera and they saw the last photos that he'd been taking. They got all the photos leading up to the collateral murder. There was no sign of violence at all. And then very weirdly, about three hours after he died, somebody used his camera one of, uh, to take a photograph of another American soldier sitting outside a tent. In the Reuters article, that person's face has been pixelated, so you can't recognize it. But I just, my mind started wondering if that was, in fact, Crazy Horse Age who had done the damage, because the soldier is looking down and a little bit, looks a little bit ashamed. Anyway, that's me going off in my, um, <laughs> but who is that person? Uh, so there was, you know, there was, this was a complete lie that they were told. I mean, if you look at the, the very important um, leak as well from 2006, and that's uh, what I was talk, referred to before, the 10 civilians who were summarily executed, shot. That was 10 people, including four women and five children, just executed. 
what happened after that is I think that the soldiers went a bit bananas that day and apparently that happens. Um, David McBride from Australia said he was a soldier in Afghanistan. He's a military whistleblower in Australia. He said He's that happened. Anymore. Yeah, but what yeah. happened after that is that at a higher level, an airstrike was staged and they bombed the place where these people lived in order to hide the evidence of what they had done, just shot people in cold blood, including kiddies. So all of these things, they should never have been classified. This is the problem. We have to maybe get into Executive Order 13526 and sort out what was illegally classified in the first place, because it does reveal a war crime or it does conceal a war crime, the classification or cause embarrassment. There's got to be some kind of way that, you know, some kind of body that checks in the first place. You can classify this or you can't. But getting into that security state is very, very difficult. It has to be done at a higher level. As far as I know, Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, this exemption hasn't really been, hasn't been practiced. That's rather a pain. Do you think there's any chance that that could be brought up in court? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. But I mean, I think that the court would probably, certainly in the British court, would say that is not a subject for this court to discuss. And maybe in the United States, it would be, that's none of your business, right? It's up to us to decide what, what gets classified or not. It's, it's not a defense to expose somebody, but this is a situation, this is a crisis, really. This classification system, I spoke to Daniel Ellsberg some years ago, it was in the beginning of 2012, and he was telling me about a study that Stephen Aftergood had done about the classification system. Stephen Aftergood, who writes for the Federation of American Scientists and does a thing called uh, Secrecy News, which is an indispensable newsletter about what's happening in the field of classification yeah. and secrecy in general. So I, I read it regularly and it's very good. But he hasn't had a clearance himself. He hasn't been inside the system himself. I don't think he or most people who haven't been inside can really fathom how corrupt that system actually is. And they think of, uh, uh, they think of the occasional hiding of mistakes, crimes, aggression, torture, things like that, as aberrations of some kind that could be removed and should be eliminated by a better classification system that doesn't classify as much. And their emphasis is entirely on uh, the idea that too much is classified. People like Steve Aftergood and others in criticizing the classification system will quote officials all of whom say there is over classification and that it goes uh, too much is classified. And sometimes they'll make uh, what seem like dramatic estimates of the amount that doesn't any longer need classification. It might be, they say, as much as 20%, 30%, even 50%, which looks pretty radical. Half of what is classified no longer deserves classification. That's a very, very misleading estimate. In my trial, the man who had written a number of the classification regulations for the Department of Defense, William F. Florence, had testified before the House uh, Operations Committee and then testified in my trial as to his estimate, having just retired, of the amount that deserved classification by the criteria of the classification system. Top secret uh, poses the threat of exceptionally grave damage to our security or our diplomatic relations, for example. Secret, uh, less grave, but still serious and so forth. His estimate was that perhaps 5% of what was classified deserved classification at the time it was classified. And that after months or, or a year or two, he said two or three years, perhaps one half of 1%. You get this example of the invasion of Normandy uh, of course, this must be classified, but, you know, a week after it happens, does the location still need to be a secret because it's history now, right? So anyway, going through anything that didn't need to be classified in the first place, 
and what shouldn't be classified anymore. What really needed to be classified that was classified today was one half of 1% and 99.5% of what is classified was really to protect people's reputations, their jobs, and save embarrassment and probably hide crimes. And that's, I mean, largely why classification shouldn't exist. Because the, I don't know, the things that actually would potentially need to be kept secret are so minuscule, like you're saying, that the system itself, just like everything else, will just be completely abused. Yeah. So yeah, just uh, going back to, to really make it clear, the uh, everyone has said that they didn't mention, uh, and it's worth saying that they didn't mention uh, in the indictment, the collateral murder video, but there are quite a number of years, I think 40 years or something. Uh, it was Christian Raffenson who said, in relation to the rules of engagement and of the 175 years that Julian is facing, uh, I think it was about 40 of those years. I could be wrong in the number, but it was something substantial. It was decades that corresponded to the, the rules of engagement, which relates to not only the collateral murder uh, video, but also that slaughter of the 10 civilians and the airstrike. But you know, when that finally came out, that leak, and that was that was a really great thing. Um, it came out in 2011, uh, sorry, 10. Um, but in 2011, when uh, the Iraqi uh, government and the Iraqi people heard about what had really happened, they were so disgusted that there was an enormous pressure on the Iraqi government and they decided that they were not going to give American soldiers immunity anymore. So if they committed crimes, they would find themselves in a court of law. So, I mean, it's dreadful that, you know, uh, soldiers deployed to Iraq, Obama uh, decided he would have to withdraw the troops. So that was a very, very positive consequence of uh, WikiLeaks release. So it would have to be withdrawn. It didn't end the war, but I mean, it sort of neutralized it to some extent. But, um, you know, it's terrible when you think about it, that it has to be the threat of another government prosecuting U.S. troops if they commit war crimes rather than their own government, because their own government, their own military had the proof. But they that's seem to a, get away with that's it. That's a hell of a point there. That really is that if, um, yeah, I mean, if our if our own government was interested in following the rule of law, we would not be trying to, you know, black bag Julian Assange in broad daylight in a courtroom and rendition him to a black hole in a supermax prison. Um, we, this this whole process, and, and we're going to wrap in the next like five or, or so minutes, um, but this whole process from really like 2006, 2007 on, uh, going the way that Julian Assange has been targeted and the number of different countries that have played a role in his targeting and the same with WikiLeaks in general. It, it is a it, living history of the erosion of rule of law. Well, that's right. That's right. Behind the wall of secrecy. This is a 20th century phenomenon. Not that the secrecy is, but the organized secrecy, the, the CIA and this whole idea that, uh, you know, people in parliament couldn't know these things even, you know, even politicians couldn't know these things, uh, but especially the public, but, you know, the whole CIA thing. And it's really at odds with the age of information, you know, <laughs> there was bound to be a clash yeah. um, one day. Um, I, did, I think that was an accident that they didn't see waiting to happen. Um, otherwise, we'd never have really got the internet, um, except it was, you know, it was Tim Berners-Lee decided to give it to humanity, would not sell it. But uh, when uh, Berners-Lee wrote HTML um, and made a gift of that to the world so that all different kinds of computers could communicate uh, with a common language, um, you know, uh, he had this idea, he had two ideas, one that 
primarily, I suppose, for him, because he was a scientist working at CERN, that people could look up anything they needed to know, right, rather than having to walk to their local library and rummage through books, which is always a pain as far as I was concerned. Um, uh, but also, also, and, and very importantly, there was a second point that everybody would have a voice, that this would be a two way exchange. You know, people would not just be passive recipients of whatever information they were given, but that people could actively uh, seek, receive and impart information, which is Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights across all frontiers and uh, on every kind of platform. So we have this, you know, we have this, this these secrecy orders, um, you know, imposed, which are in direct conflict with the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you've got one country that is fighting against this universal law, except the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and international law. We don't have a body that really upholds it. Maybe that's where the work needs to be done at a at a legal level, but of course there's all kinds of world politics that would probably be blocking that. But you know, we're all standing by going, but this is breaking international law. Not not that not that local laws haven't been broken as well. Um uh, when Julian was uh, ejected from the embassy, you know, extradition was banned, um, was illegal for all Ecuadorian citizens. And overnight, uh, Moreno claimed that, you know, his, his citizenship's gone, right? So we can kick him out. But there was due process in Ecuador of some, you know, threatened with getting their citizenship taken away from them. There is a process of appeal. None of that happened. You've got this might is right thing that is stomping all over international law and human rights. And it's got to be fixed. It really does. If our world is going to, you know, go back to law and order. But I don't think it was ever there. There were always these secrets. It's just that we didn't know that there were things we didn't know. That's, oh, gosh, I sound like somebody speaking now, don't I? <laughs> but there's a, we're a lot more aware of what we don't know now. <laughs> But the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, and there are known non unknowns and unknown. Oh man, that guy! <laughs> that wow. guy! Wow. Um, Andrew, would you like to take us home here? Yeah, absolutely. And just as we're parting to cap this all off, Mike Pompeo is going after the members and family members of the International Criminal Court for investigating U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's an ongoing thing that kind of is running parallel to uh, Julian Assange's persecution and the, the global lockdowns that we're seeing. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We really appreciate you joining us. And I would really, again, like to encourage everyone to um, help us share our GoFundMe link, but also participate in the action to get President Obrador to talk to Donald Trump about Julian Assange. I want to thank Steve, Misty, and Kathy for joining us. Um, if you like what you have been watching, you can find us on Twitter at action underscore the number for Assange or on our website actionforassange.com. Kathy, where can people find you and where can people find uh, CN Live? Oh, so go to the Consortium News website, consortiumnews.com. And there is a CN Live page. Uh, you'll see it in the menu bar, the horizontal one. So if you go there, we've got every episode in there. Or just go to YouTube and we have a, a YouTube channel. There is a another, there is another uh, Consortium News YouTube channel. That was Bob Parry's actually uh, for a while. But I have, so there's four videos on, on there, but I've got them all and I have put them on our new channel. So you'll see it's it's his face uh, in red. That's with all the videos. We've got a couple of hundred films now since we started back in um, July last year. Um, in fact, CN Live is about to have its first birthday. Um, so, wow, that's gone very, very quickly. Uh, we're up to season two, episode 12 tonight with Andrew Fowler. And episode 13, it's going to be Whitney Webb again talking about Elaine Maxwell and the Epstein story. And that's coming maybe tomorrow. 
tomorrow as well. So we're going to be doing two back to back. So I've got to get back to work. Oh, one other thing I just would really like to tell you that it's something that is really worth watching. Um, so speaking of Andrew Fowler, um, it's on YouTube. You can find it now and you can watch the whole documentary. So it's called Sex, Lies and Julian Assange. So this is the whole early story of Sweden. But um, there's a lot of things in there that uh, fill in the story uh, concerning the Manning period. What you'll see in there as well is the subpoena, the grand jury subpoena. So this is going back to 2011. This was Andrew Scoop. He was the first to reveal the existence, show the evidence of a grand jury inquiry. And in fact, that one there is what has a lot of that has come out in this very latest indictment. So it's really interesting to go and look at that backstory, Sex, Lies and Julian Assange, I think easily the best documentary as well that has been made about the Assange story. Noted.